Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to give people another minute or two to log in. But in the meantime, if you'd like to introduce yourself, say hi in the chat. We'd love to say hi. Um, but there's also a poll up, uh, which will help us get to know who you are, who we're talking to, just so we can make sure that we are making it relevant for the people who are who are actually attending. So if you could answer the poll and say hi, that would be amazing. And we'll kick off in another minute or two. Looks like we've got a very shy group today, Caroline. Hello, Craig. Hi, Pauline. Thank you, Craig, for being the first person. Hello, Vicky. Ah, allyship group. Great, fantastic. Sky representing. Fantastic. Great, well, we do have a good amount of stuff to go through, so I think we're gonna start, but do feel free to um, put who you are in the chat and introduce yourselves just so everybody gets to know who's, who's here as well. It's nice to, nice to start, a, start a community. Um, but I wanted to say, and also the poll too, make sure you, you can do the, do the poll. Fantastic. Well, great. Well, I'm going to get started. And first, I will say welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Happy Thursday, I think it is. Do I have that right, Caroline? Thursday? Yes. Fantastic. Great. Good start. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we are the Honeycomb Works. Um, our mission is to help everyone at work feel like they belong and are free to invent. We create inclusive and innovative cultures, habit by habit, person by person, because that's what actually makes a culture. It's the things that people do on a daily, everyday basis. And we do that through behavioral science, research, and technology to make sure that we can scale that across an organization. I'm Melissa. I'm the founder and CEO of the, of the Honeycomb Works. Um, I founded the Honeycomb Works about four years ago. I say about, we're about three weeks away from our four year anniversary. Yay! In other times we might have a party, but now maybe we'll just have a few virtual drinks or something like that. But um, but yeah, so very excited to, to celebrate our four year anniversary. Before that, I spent most of my career in big organizations trying to drive change and, and innovation. And I'm going to start this session with a bit of a introduction scene setting, and then I'm gonna turn over to Caroline. Hi, afternoon everyone. So I'm Caroline Marsh, I'm the Director of Behavioral Science and Research for Honeycomb Works. So I will be, I led on the research we're gonna be talking about this afternoon. So I'm gonna be taking you through the findings and also just as importantly, what we can do about the findings. Great, and then finally, we're gonna end with your questions. So do, do please post them in the chat. We'll try to get through as many as we can, and if there are ones that we don't get to, we'll figure out a way to follow up after. after. And, um, and there will be a report that we produce off the back of this, so everybody that signed up will get access to the report. So just in case you miss anything or you're frantically scribbling, you will get, you will get access to that. Oh, and I was, I put it on the slide so I wouldn't forget, but I almost did anyway. If you want to keep in touch with us, there's a subscribe link that should be on your screen through most of the presentation. So if any of that, any point throughout you say, you know what, those two ladies are kind of smart. I'd like to hear from them some more. Just click that sign up and we'll send you regular, regular updates. So first, I wanted to talk about where we want to get to, what the goal of all of this, all of this work, work is, um, which essentially is a workplace where everyone, 
everyone feels like they belong. So what does it mean to feel like you belong? It means that you are respected, that you can make a mistake and know that people won't think less of you, that you feel safe to bring as much of yourself to work as you, as you want. This feeling can be hurt by overt and clear instances of bias and discrimination, but not just that. Things like not seeing people who look like us in leadership positions or in fact anywhere else in the organization makes us wonder if this is a place for us. Things that might not seem like a big deal to some people, to others, can be really hurtful. For example, a black woman I was speaking with said every time she shared an idea, the response would be, that's actually a good idea. Now the first time, okay, maybe even take it as a compliment. But when it happens over and over again, you start to think actually, why is that a surprise? Why are they questioning my capability? And you feel like you're just not respected. You're not, you're not accepted there. We use belonging as our goal because we wanna go beyond just reducing discrimination, racism, unfairness, to creating truly inclusive cultures. So if we have that as our end goal, we can try to, we can fix everything else along the way, but we won't settle for just getting rid of overt unfairness. It's about creating these workplaces where everybody can invent and do their best and not be worried about whether or not they, they belong there. Now, if you signed up for this, um, you probably, hopefully you read the description and you know this is sharing our research. Um, for those of you that know us, you know that we are a research, evidence, and data-driven organizations. One of the reasons we founded the Honeycomb Works was because we were a bit frustrated by all of the DNI initiatives, programs, organizations, products that didn't have a solid evidence base and sometimes could actually do more harm than good. So when we look at research, um, that takes a few different forms. The first thing we do is look at the existing research, academic, rigorous research. We evaluate the evidence behind it, assess its applicability to what we're trying to do, and then apply it to either our interventions or app and technology. Then we also do research projects with organizations who have really tough questions that they can't answer. For example, one organization was struggling to figure out why people were struggling to get promoted. We found some very interesting things with that one that we'll be sharing in, in September. So look out for that. Again, click the subscribe button. Um, but finally, the last bit is our own, our own original research. And we do that where we see a gap, where we have a question that we want answered and we can't find any research or evidence about it. And that's where Caroline comes in puts on her academic hat and, um, and, does the, and does the research. She's gonna explain in more detail about this particular research project. So I'm not gonna go, go into depth on that right now. But the starting point was wanting to understand allies within organizations because they are one of the most effective ways to change a culture. So people within the organization trying to drive a change. Now, Today, we're not just talking about allies, we're talking about advocates as well. So it's worth spending a moment on, on definitions. Um, an ally is someone who is working to fight bias and discrimination on behalf of another group. An advocate is somebody who is fighting bias and discrimination on behalf of their own group. So, if I, as a white person, am protesting against racism, should have done a quick quiz there. What am I? I am an ally. If I, as a gay woman, am fighting against transphobia, I'm an ally. If I, as a gay woman, are fighting against homophobia, I'm an advocate. Now, you can imagine if you're an advocate and you're that person who's experiencing the bias and discrimination while also trying to fight it, you can imagine how exhausting that could be. Some of you might not have to imagine it. That might actually be you fighting that battle, those two battles on a daily, on a daily basis. So finally, why are they so, why are they so important? 
um, the key thing, one of the key things to understand is that you need, you need both. Advocates have the direct personal experience, the understanding of having lived with racism, homophobia, ableism, whatever, whatever it is that they're experiencing, they're the ones that know what that's like. And sharing that lived experience by someone who is black, for example, is key to getting people to open their eyes to racism. Allies can't do this without advocates. But you can't leave the burden of fixing it on advocates. Some people, some advocates, will want to be part of the solution, but you can't expect that. It's too much to ask. And if all you're doing is asking advocates to explain their experiences of bias and discrimination, to share these really painful things that happened to them, then all you're asking them to do is relive trauma for no reason, for no impact, for nothing that's going to help them. The point of allies is to share the load, to fight the battles and change the system for the, from the inside out, to challenge discrimination and start changing their own and other people's behaviors. If you're setting up a support group for disabled people, you need disabled people to be central to that. But we want allies to do things like fight for the budget. Our goal today is to actually make the whole organization an ally to both allies and advocates. Hopefully that's not confusing, but there are these two groups that are in organizations that are individuals, allies and advocates, and we want to help the organization empower, protect and support those people so they can do this work in a way that has an impact and protects their mental health and well-being. So I'm gonna turn over to Caroline, um, but we're so glad that you can join us because again, the more people you have doing this work, the less heavy lifting you'll need from any, any individual. Caroline? So as I said, I'm gonna take you through the actual research itself. So this research started, and I know there's a, at least a couple of people on the call who actually participated, but I won't say who, um, uh, who um, this research started because I kept being asked, and I know Melissa was experiencing the same thing, these really similar questions by people we knew. So these weren't clients, these were people in our network, friends, family, even friends of friends who knew what work we did. We were getting these questions from people um, about how to make their organizations more diverse and inclusive. So, how do well we know what to do? Where should we start? We want to do some events. What kind of events should we do? Um, we might start looking at gender. Me and Melissa, no, don't do that. If you want to have a conversation about why you shouldn't start with gender, don't get in touch. Um, but all sorts of different questions. But they had a common theme, which was just like, how do I do this? Um, and it came a bit of a standing joke that every time I heard from someone in our wider network asking to get a coffee, that it would be for free advice. Um, but it got us thinking. It got us thinking about what do you do when you have all these personal experiences that are making you want to maybe challenge bias and discrimination, and you have business experience, you have a job, but maybe you don't have a background in diversity inclusion or psychology or HR or any of the related fields, and you don't really know where to start. How do you find that information? Where do you go? Um, can you find resources? How do you find maybe a bit of a route map? How do you navigate all the noise, and there is a lot of noise, to find out what's actually going to make a difference versus what isn't? Um, and obviously there's social media, um, but that's really hard to navigate too. That is a lot of noise. Um, so I started looking, unsurprisingly, at the academic research and then the organizational research and then just the anecdotes. Um, and I was struggling. So because we have a, a good network of people, we thought, OK, let's actually do this properly and do a bit of research. So a fair amount of the research out there that I could find originally was around employee resource groups and affinity groups. Now, if you don't know what that means, it is um, a network within an organization that is typically been set up to uh, both enable people to meet each other who are like each other, to provide Caroline, yep. sorry to interrupt you, but we're, we're, it sounds like some people are having problems with sound, So, but some people aren't. So I think it might be quiet. So perhaps you can put your, your mic closer. I think some people are able to hear, so it might be individual, but we had a couple of people saying it was, it was quiet. So if you want to put your Is mic Is that any better? 
those who can't hear? Okay, I'll try and shout. Okay, we've had, we have a, a, quite a few people saying they can hear you fine now, so I think we're good. Okay, yeah. great. Um, so yeah, I started looking at research, found that in pre-resource groups and affinity networks, there's quite a lot of research around. And what I was just saying was, for those who, who missed it, is these are groups that enable people to meet others like them and provide a safe space, um, as well as typically trying to advocate for that group. And there's quite a lot of research around how to do that, but I was really struggling to find information on the individuals in a business who were maybe trying to, trying to do the work. So we set about trying to do something about that. So we set out with a goal, firstly, pretty important. Um, really simple goal. We just wanted to better understand the motivations of people choosing to do this work, choosing to do diversity and inclusion work, improve organizational culture on top of their day job, to find out what we needed to do to support them better and enable them to just have an impact, really. Um, and we thought, based on the questions we've been being asked, but that would be to do with data and evidence-based program ideas, initiatives, networks, maybe introductions to other people, and knowledge on behavior change. We were wrong. <laughs> and I'll take you through why we were wrong. But briefly, what we did to conduct this research, don't worry, I'm not gonna give you a deep methodology unless you're particularly interested, which will be at the back of the report when you receive it for those who are, who are that way inclined. Um, so firstly, we just identified 15 people. Now, um, 15 might not sound like a lot, but the purpose of this research was to really understand the real experiences of people. So not the numbers, but how they approach these challenges. So qualitative research is really about understanding individuals, understanding a group of people who have something in common. And in this case, it was all UK-based people who were working in some way to make organizations more diverse and inclusive on top of the job they're employed to do. Um, and we weren't specific about the role they had. They didn't have to be working for an employee resource group, for example. They had to just be actively trying to push progress. And over about a year, I interviewed these 15 people from a huge range of organizations, and that included everything from media and broadcasting, civil service, banking, tech, a um, huge range of different identities and perspectives. Um, and the people I interviewed were really inspiring. And I have to say, I felt very privileged that they were giving me an hour, hour and a half of their time when they were clearly very busy with their day jobs and all this additional work. Um, but they were doing all sorts of things. So leading networks, so BAME, LGBTQ networks, gender networks, mental health networks, some people I met were leading two or even three of those networks in the organizations they worked for. Um, they were sometimes in leadership positions, trying to shift perspectives. Maybe they were advocating for more support for disabled people or increasing awareness around trans issues, um, leading all sorts of different incredible initiatives. Um, so I had these, these conversations with people, similar structure to each conversation. Um, and then looked for themes across all of those all of those interviews. And with research like this, I'm looking for patterns. I'm looking for topics and experiences that come up repeatedly. I'm not looking to be able to generalize. Yeah, this is always how people experience it. I'm looking to really understand the experience they're going for, see going through, see if there are any consistencies so that we can use that information to make it better in the future. So that's what we did. So what did we find out? So... Um, as I said, we're looking for themes. There were just five big themes that came up. We go into these in a lot more detail in the report, but I'm going to give you the, as much as I can here. Um, firstly, these individuals are really motivated by their personal experiences. That's what's driving a lot of people. That's probably not a big surprise. They find it very frustrating trying to work out what their role is within the organization doing this work. Often in need of a platform and support about gaining this huge amount of personal development in doing this work. But they have to then balance that with navigating the potentially very negative, in some cases, impacts on their career. And I'm going to go through each of these in more detail before going through what, what we can do about this. And um, as I go through, we're going to put another poll up for each one because I'm really curious about your experiences. Quite a few of you have already said you're trying to work as allies and advocates in your own organisations. 
So basically, we're going to use you as additional research participants. Um, we'll share what you respond afterwards, obviously not your individual responses, just the, the aggregated information. So firstly, motivated by experience. Now, this probably isn't that big a surprise, but nearly everyone I spoke to had experienced bias and discrimination directly addressed at them through their lives and particularly at work. Um, and everyone I spoke to could talk pretty much at length if, you, if they wanted to about the different experiences they had. And, and these range from um, things like being discriminated against or put down for simply being a woman because there was a belief, as with the quote on the screen, that a woman can be analytical. That included uh, people being passed over repeatedly for promotion uh, by white people. It included things like being the only person that looked like them in a leadership team or maybe in a whole organization. For some people I spoke to, it wasn't direct experiences of discrimination or bias, it was about the consequences of discrimination and bias that they experienced. So as an example, the quote on the screen, and I should have said earlier actually, the quotes aren't direct, direct quotes, they've been modified slightly just to make sure that there's absolutely nothing identifiable about, about them. Um, but the quote on the screen was um, about somebody going through a substantial recruitment process to try and make sure that they were building a far more diverse business than they've had. And recruiting all these amazing people, then the more resigning with a few months, because as it says, it was a pretty nice place to work, but I didn't feel like it was the place for me. Basically, they didn't feel like they belonged there because nothing had been done to make them feel included. And it meant that this particular individual had a real light bulb moment, had a real knock on them, that they suddenly realized that this was, this was really important. It wasn't just about diversity, it was about the experience of belonging somewhere. But all of this motivated people to be, want to be part of the solution. And every single person I spoke to, there were experiences that led them to this point, to wanting to do something about it. And they might not always have had a clear plan. It might not have been always really, you know, mapped out what they were going to do, but they knew they wanted to, to drive change. And a small number of the people I spoke to were purely allies. They were purely trying to make work more equal and fair for other people, for groups that they weren't a part of, um, despite not having any experience of discrimination themselves. And there were quite a few people that started out as advocates, so started out with experiences and, and trying to help other people like them, and then started to realize that actually they wanted to go further than that, that other people were struggling too, and they wanted to, to broaden out their support. But what all of this means, and why I find it slightly concerning, is that you end up with a smallish group of people doing most of the heavy lifting, both advocating for people like them and trying to be an ally to other people. And most of those people are also having to deal in some form with subtle or maybe not so subtle forms of discrimination. That's a lot, especially when you consider that there's other people in the organization who aren't dealing with any of this stuff. They're just doing the job. So I'm curious what you've all said. Ah, so we'll just put the, I'll put the other poll up. So the other poll is out there to say, where did your motivation for becoming an ally or an advocate come from? Okay. So direct experiences and experience with the consequences. Okay, so a bit of a balance. So that's, that's sort of what I found. So the second theme was around purpose. And there was this real sense of frustration uh, for some people that progress was equated with engagement rather than real change. And um, what we mean by that is that senior leaders, diversity and inclusion, maybe people who were sponsoring any kind of initiative or invested in it in some way, were more interested in maybe how many people signed up for a network or an event than they were what the impact of holding that event was. 
So as I said, many of these people were doing this work because they've directly been impacted by discrimination in some way. So they really wanted to make a change. So whilst they were really interested in, and very happy to do this work, like as the quote says on the screen, so parties, festivities, um, what they were really trying to do was try and see people like them in positions of power. That's what they were trying to make happen. And they were struggling to, to find a way to do that. So the conversation ended up being about how they were raising awareness and focusing on education of the other people rather than having an impact. And that's not to say that that isn't having an impact. Um, but it became about the impact they were having on individuals around them, not the business as a whole. So they talked about the impact of seeing a senior exec member realising there really is a problem here after an event they'd run. Um, or as the quote on the screen says, about being approached by directly by individuals to say, yep, I'm on board, I want to help, what can I do? And to be clear, this is really important. So raising awareness, education is really, really important. Um, but the frustration comes because they didn't always feel like HR, leadership, diversity and inclusion members were fully on board with really making the change. So I'm going to pop up the next poll as well. So we're just interested this time in... Um, and whether you think your organisation is actually trying to make a real change. I'll leave that one there as I carry on. Now oh, that's good. Wow. Most people are saying that it's really about creating a truly diverse and inclusive culture. That's fantastic. Wow. I'm really, pleased, really pleased to see that. Okay. So having a platform. So not everybody I spoke to had the same level of frustration. The frustration was there, um, but there seemed to be a real connection between whether or not someone had a platform, and by platform I mean visibility, whether they felt like they were being seen, they were being heard by others, whether they had the ability to influence. So the more of a platform people had, the more power people had, and the more opportunities to create real change they felt like they had. Now, a platform doesn't necessarily mean seniority. It doesn't mean that they were really senior in the business. It might do, that definitely helps. Um, but it might also might come in the form of a good relationship. So a good relationship with a manager, a good relationship with a senior leader, sponsorship in some form. Um, it might just come from knowing other people in the business, or in some cases it came from, they felt like they had a platform themselves because they were somebody who um, spoke up and had a really strong network through the organisation. And it's not a big shock, budget was a big deal. <laughs> Having budget really made a difference for people. Now, a lot of people were doing a lot with not very much. Um, but there was a distinct difference in the way people talked about the role, the work they were doing, and the impact they were having, um, and how long they wanted to keep doing this work from for when they didn't have a platform. So what we're really talking about here is having allies. <laughs> Unsurprised. A senior leader, a manager, somebody else in the business, other people in general in the business who are helping, who are stepping forward, maybe helping to fight for budget or for resources, or just to say, you know what, this is really important, let's pay attention to it. And without that platform, Without that support, without allies, without a supportive manager to talk to, without colleagues who said, yep, yep, what you're doing is really important and I'm going to help out with that, there was a lot of talk of additional stress, of the risks in challenging and raising issues, and that they didn't think that they could necessarily continue with this long time, as did the, the quote on the screen, I just can't do this here. Um, and in those cases, some of them talked about leaving the organisation soon. And it seems pretty obvious when I say it, but if you're trying to influence and change a culture and you don't feel fully supported to do that, that's going to be more stressful. There'll be more anxiety, there'll be more conflict. And one of the big issues here is that most of these people are also experiencing discrimination in some form, which is stressful in itself. And then in trying to take maybe some control of the situation or make it best for other people, 
even more stress is being created. And where people were struggling, and it wasn't everyone, but where they were struggling, they weren't saying, I'm going to stop doing this, I'm going to stop campaigning for diversity and inclusion. They were saying, I have to leave the business because, of course, this is about their identity. A lot of these people are doing this work because they've directly experienced discrimination. So to stay somewhere that won't support that is just too painful for them. So, same question again. Well, not same question again. Has your career been impacted by being an ally or an advocate? I'm looking at that previous one, wow, really most of you felt like your organisations are doing the right thing. It's important. Okay. So my career has been helped and I'm not sure. Split between the two. A couple of people saying that their career suffered. Yeah, again, that kind of echoes what I heard. So personal development. Now, obviously, this is why we set out to do this research. We were interested in the development side where people were getting the information from and how they, how they were using it. Um, and despite everything we thought we were going to find out, we didn't. Um, but what we did find out is that for a lot of people, this was this huge source of development. It was an opportunity to gain exposure to parts of the business, to build networks with people they wouldn't have done otherwise, and to do things, as with the quote, that they did never normally got a chance to do, maybe presenting or negotiating, in, and those weren't things they'd do in the normal course of their job. Um, what was interesting is that there was a real recognition of how complex this topic is um, and how difficult it was at times and that it took a lot of time and a lot of patience. Um, they didn't necessarily feel like other people recognised that all the time. Um, and interestingly, no one mentioned being given any tools or development by the organisation to help them, not formally. There was little bits and pieces. Um, some people had really good diversity and inclusion leads or mentors in the business or other people they went to or managers, but there wasn't a lot of formal support. A small number of people did also talk about feeling like they could not go to HR or diversity and inclusion for support, which was, was, which was a little concerning and a little sad. Um, but no specific provision for most people was being, was being provided. Um, and unsurprisingly, most people were getting their information through social media and through their networks. So a lot of people talked about having other people in their organisation they turn to, to bounce ideas off and have conversations about things. Quite a few people go to events, quite a few people go to networking events or have joined groups. Um, but yeah, social media was easily the most popular. So curious again how you are learning and finding your information. Okay, bit of a mix. Events like this one, yeah, especially at the moment, right? <laughs> okay. So, career impacts. This is one of the big ones. Um, and I have to say, I probably should have thought about this more, this, that this was likely to be one of the outcomes. Um, and it was a little bit of a surprise when it started emerging, and it started emerging very quickly as a very strong, a very strong theme. And it, it probably isn't that big a surprise, given everything I've already said, that um, there's this real feeling of tension and conflict between the benefits people get from doing this work and the difficulties or the penalties. Um, a lot of people talked about the feelings of reward, the feelings of how they, um, they really felt like they were making a difference for people, um, recognition from their managers and their peers. Um, the networks I mentioned, a lot of people talked about it as like they met so many more people than they would have done through their organizations. Um, some people talked about it as really invigorating, reinvigorating their day job and their motivation for their day job. Um, but then this was in tension with the fact that they have this, a lot of pressure 
a huge amount of additional work to take on and for some people really highly administrative as well um, and that for some people it felt like maybe they were being penalized in some way in their appraisals or in their promotions or their reviews and that's the one I'm going to talk about in a bit more detail. So most people I spoke to didn't think that the work they were doing was being accounted for in their goals, reviews, promotions. A couple of people I spoke to, that was starting to change. Um, but it was seen as a, a, maybe an add-on, as volunteer work, there was a feeling. And so it just wasn't brought into their, their pay reviews, the conversations about their performance. Um, what was interesting is that there was a huge range of different times, amounts of time people said they thought they were spending on this work, but it averaged out to around 20% of people's time. Some people, that was a lot more. A couple of people even talked about it feeling like it was a full-time job to do diversity and inclusion work on top of their day job. But that's a lot. 20% of your time a day, a week, spent on additional work in on top of your day job that maybe you're not in any way being recognised for, or it's not forming part of your performance reviews. And quite a few people talked about the fact that they thought that their career had suffered as a result, that they weren't meeting their goals, their KPIs, um, and as a result, they actually might be held back from, from promotions, which um, I certainly find a little bit worrying. Now, that's all compounded by the fact that even when the work they were doing was highly successful, there was a feeling that that success didn't belong to them, it belonged to the organisation. So this caused some conflict for people because they felt like we're doing all this work, I'm doing this work, my colleagues are doing this work, and then we're not always getting the support we need or the recognition we need until we do something huge. And then it's seen as a massive success for the organisation. And they're really proud of that. They don't want to take that away, but they also want the recognition of themselves and the fact that I'm doing a lot here and that shouldn't be counting against me. And to me, this is this is huge. So it's probably not something a lot of organisations are necessarily thinking about when they're you know, getting people from around the business involved in doing work for, to improve organisational culture. So not necessarily thinking about the fact that actually people's careers might be negatively impacted. That once again, we are using people being impacted by discrimination to fix discrimination at the same time as further penalizing them for it. And again, this wasn't everybody, but there definitely was a few, a few people in there for whom this was a really significant issue. And I think even few people, that being a significant issue, is a concern for me. So I'm also curious about whether or not you feel like you have any, any support in doing this work. So I'm going to pause for a moment here before I go into um, the next bit, which is going to be about what we can do about this, just to see if there's any questions that anyone has. I didn't agree with the findings. Yeah, we did. We, really did have, we did have one question come in there. We had, we have one that I think is better safer after you do the recommendations. Um, but one okay. question was around. Um, HR, why did people feel like they couldn't go to HR and get, get support? So there was a mixture of reasons here. So for um, the so black and Asian people I spoke to, um, it was that HR is typically white and female. Not always, but that was the response I got. So they're not going to get what I'm going through here. Um, for some people, they just didn't trust them to... Um, to hold what they were taking, what they were saying seriously because of experiences they'd had in the past. Um, but there was a couple of issues with um, uh, seeing diversity and inclusion and HR people as blockers to the work they were trying to do rather than facilitators. Now I'm actually going to talk about this briefly in the recommendations actually, but um, where we saw um, this relationship between diversity and inclusion and HR working the most effectively was where the DNI person, the HR person who was interacting with everybody who was doing this work, was acting more as a facilitator, so and an enabler. So 
So making introductions, making sure people have sponsorship, um, not saying you can't do that because actually we've got another project over here, but saying we have another project over here, let's see how we can bring these things together, if that makes sense. So it was a mixture of reasons. It wasn't everyone. Some people talked about having fantastic HR and DNI people. Um, it just varied across across the different people I spoke to. So we'll talk about what to do, or firstly, what not to do. Um, so one of the other things that came out for a few people was that um, they were concerned about going to managers or HR. This was another reason about these penalties they were facing um, because they felt like they might lose this work and might be taken away from them in, in some way. Now, they didn't necessarily have evidence for that, but it was a concern. And one of the really strong things that came through that was that, yes, they face difficulties in doing this work, but it really matters to people. It's a really important part of their job and really motivating, so they don't want to lose it, even if it is impacting a little bit negatively on their, on their careers. Um, so I would say, these findings, if you're seeing people struggling, the reaction should not be, and given you're on this event, it probably wouldn't be, um, but it shouldn't be to reduce or discourage employee resource groups or affinity networks. They do have a place. If they're done well, they can be really, really impactful, and they do give people a safe space. Um, don't discourage people from getting involved in this work, and don't remove these responsibilities from people. Have conversations, absolutely, about how that can be managed better, but don't take it away from people, because that's just penalizing them, penalizing them further. What can you do though? <laughs> so I'm gonna go through each of the different groups just to have a, a bit of a chat about what you could do for each if you're in each of these each of these groups. Um, I would say if you are an advocate, um, if you're somebody who's trying to do this work um, on top of your, your job and you're struggling, we are going to send a report out as we mentioned so you can also use that as evidence if you're going to talk to people and you're struggling. So if you're a manager, firstly show an interest. Um, one of the, quite a few people talked about having incredibly supportive managers and others said that their managers showed no interest or actually found conversations quite awkward or uncomfortable. So if you're a manager, show an interest in yourself, start asking questions. Really try to understand how their new roles and skills, because people are learning huge amounts of stuff that they're not learning on their job. You can use that. Um, and I don't mean that in a really uh, manipulative way. I mean, <laughs> that means that they have these skills that they may be able to bring into their, into their day job. Take that account of that in their reviews. Even if the structures around you aren't set up to take account of these skills and the work they're doing in their reviews, there are probably ways that you can balance that out. Um, set goals that take into account this additional work they're doing. Ask what they need. And really importantly, introductions. As much as people talked about um, having amazing new networks, people talked about needing to know people. So there's so many different things they're having to do from administration or needing technology or events or being able to have to do comms or newsletters, all sorts of things that maybe they've never had to do before. And that means maybe finding people around the organisation who can help with that. Maybe even volunteer to be a sponsor or a mentor. Um, if you're a business leader, so one of the biggest things here was sponsorship. So programs, initiatives, projects, whatever they were, that have sponsorship, and this isn't a big shock, um, are gonna are gonna be less stressful and more likely to get somewhere. Um, but also talk about champion champion the work that's being done, but also the individuals doing it, give the credit where it's due. So we have this fantastic fame network that I'm sponsoring. I'm involved in and here I'm going to tell you all about it but also these are the individuals leading it and doing all the work. Develop managers so and this is for HR and DNI as well if you've got manager programs or if you can coach people make sure that you're enabling them to have these conversations and deal with these additional stretch projects which is effectively what they are that people are doing on top of their day job. Fine budget but that's a given. Uh, <laughs> um, really push for um, uh, impact rather than just engagement, really help people to do that um, and support HR to do what they need as well. So HR and DNI, this isn't going to be that shocking given what I've been talking about, but performance processes, I spent a long time in HR 
and talent. And it, it's hard sometimes when you're reviewing these processes and you feel like you have to do it all the time. But there's a big concern here that they are actually penalising people that you need to be supporting. Um, so really have a think about whether or not what you're asking of people is accounted for in that, especially if you're they're doing initial 20, 25 percent. Um, again, push for impact, not just engagement. Maybe think about that in terms of the events you're running or the work you're doing as well. Um, and I mentioned this before, central facilitator rather than blocker. And again, it is really hard when you've got multiple projects and initiatives going on all over the place. But where this works really well is where people are pulling those different initiatives together and joining them together rather than no, you can't do that because we've got that going over here. It's finding ways to bring people in rather than push them away. Guidance and resources, if you can. So guidance and resources about how people can do this stuff more effectively. Anything you can give them that helps navigate that noise is really helpful. Um, and training and tools. So not just about diversity and inclusion, but they have all these things that they're having to do on top of their job that maybe they haven't done before. And some of the people I spoke to, you know, they've been in their careers a long time, but they've never had to present and suddenly they're having to present or something like that. So it's just making sure that that training and support is available to them and that they know it is. Um, for those of you who are advocates, um, this isn't your job to fix, but if you are struggling with your managers, we did find that a lot of people talked about feeling uncomfortable and we found this in broader research we've done as well and a lot of our clients. Managers find this, normal managers, but a lot of people find these conversations uncomfortable, so they just don't pass. And it doesn't always mean they're not interested. So starting to talk to them about it and making it more comfortable, whilst it's not your job to do that, might help them to open up a little bit. Um, do talk to diversity and inclusion or HR, whoever it is, if you are feeling penalised, go as a group if you need to, send a report if you need to, um, but do start to have those conversations. Um, it isn't right that you're being penalised or your career is being penalised. And again, not your job to fix this, um, but do what you can. Um, but also become an ally. So I'm not telling you to do more work. And a lot of people I spoke to were both advocates and allies. But again, where it seems to be working better was where the different groups, the different initiatives, the different projects were coming together and working together. And we've seen that in a lot of the work we do as well. Caroline, before you go, before you go off this slide, we've had a we've had a comment from somebody who says they've spoken to their line manager who's sympathetic, but says they can't do anything about it. So, what would you recommend for somebody like that? Would that would the next step be to try to go to DNI and HR as a as a group? Yeah, definitely. If you can provide evidence, do so. Um, yeah, very much so. Go to leaders if you have sponsors of the work you're doing. Great. Um, it's about, it, people can't fix what they don't know, can they? Um, so it's about making sure that people are aware of those issues and really elevating them out. Um, and your manager might be powerless to do something, but someone else might not be. Um, the one thing I might say is if your manager is powerless, maybe have a conversation about the fact that you're going to go elsewhere, depending on your relationship with your manager. So you're not doing that going over the head thing that's going to damage, damage your relationship with them. But yeah, feel free to use the report as evidence if you need to. Um, and for those of you trying to be an ally, continue, please. Um, talk to your managers, talk to other people about the work you're doing, um, but take on some of the hard fights as well. So um, if I was trying to lead a women's network, for example, and I was fighting for budget, well, I'm slightly less likely to be successful than if a man helped yeah, who, who did the fighting for the budget, which sounds really patronizing. It sounds kind of horrible, doesn't it? Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit true. Um, so and it's taking on some of those difficult battles from people that mean that they are freed up to go and do other work. So at the same time, make sure that if you are helping with this work, if you're trying to be an ally, you're leading a group, an initiative, whatever it is, you're not trying to take over, you're not taking it away from anyone else. You're just being an ally, giving them support, making sure their voice is heard and helping to unblock things where you can. So just to summarize that a little bit, so what we're really talking about here is individual support. So making sure that the individuals around you are getting the support they need to do this work. 
structural support, particularly if you're leaders, HR, DNI, thinking about the structures and processes that are enabling or preventing people from doing what they need to do, or in some way they're being penalised for doing what they need to do. Remember, this isn't volunteer work. Um, and, and that was a feeling for a lot of people that they felt like they were seen as volunteers. Um, and then impact and engagement. So impact is really important. Um, but there's a lot of conversations about, I feel like I'm just doing work to get people engaged. And this needs to be about impact as well. Okay, so final thing before I hand back for more questions and back to Melissa. So this isn't going in the report. This I've noticed in the last two or three weeks and it's totally anecdotal. Um, but since being interviewed, and remember this is only 15 people, so this could be a coincidence. 40% of the people I interviewed have left their roles. The majority of those who have left their roles are black, Asian, and or LGBTQ. And the majority of those still in role or have been promoted are white. This is 100% anecdotal and only 15% this was, as I said, not part of the research. But it did raise some questions for me. And they were questions that I had throughout the research as well around does doing this work impact people's career differently? So it seems to be impacting people's career. And I'd love to validate that. And if you are an organization who would like to partner on that research, we would love to hear from you. But not just is it impacting people's careers, but how is it impacting their careers? And is it impacting people from different demographic groups differently? And really importantly, what can you do about it? So if you'd like to talk to us about that, about something you're interested in partnering with, we would love to have a conversation with you. Um, I'm going to hand back to you, Melissa, now, and we'll see if you have any questions. Yeah, so just quickly before we before we get to questions, the, the link at the bottom of your screen has changed to a book a book a chat because that's if you are in an organization that um, that would like to collaborate on collaborate on research with us. We'd love to we'd love to speak with you. Um, if you want to chat with us a little bit more about how we can help, um, we'd love to do that as well. Then also we started a beta community on, on LinkedIn. And the idea is that we get a group of people who are allies and advocates together, since the research says you are using social media to help support, support each other, where we'll also be providing some information and useful tips and tricks and, and stuff. But it's an experiment. Uh, we know how busy people are. So we want to get a core group of people in to start, see if it's useful. And then if it is, we'll expand it out broader. Um, so now um, we have, we do have a few questions. I think the first one, which sort of leads on well from the beta community and the follow on research was um, whether any set of tools or training provision has, has come out of the, come out of the research. So I didn't, um, I didn't put that question in just for the record. <laughs> So um, actually, we've been developing some training and tools for a couple of years now, um, which is part of why it came about, um, uh, because we're having these conversations with organizations about developing particularly tools for allies. So how do you develop ally behavior? How do you go about challenging bias? How do you, as a manager, make sure you're a good sponsor, as a leader? So all of this stuff around how do you create an inclusive culture through being an ally? Um, so we've been developing that for the last couple of years and working with quite a lot of organisations on it. So very happy to have a conversation about that. Um, there are various resources out there. Um, we struggled to find, and I struggled to find, um, something that was consistently um, enabling people to really change their behaviour and really think about how they did this stuff, um, which is why we ended up developing what we did. Yeah, and... I one of the reasons we thought this research was so important is because we have been for the last couple of years been trying to help develop allies and advocates and so we wanted to make sure that now we're helping support those people within the organization as well so i think what's going to come out of the quantitative research so the first thing obviously is the community where we're helping people we want to help people to give them tools and, and things that they can use to help there probably is going to be something around we're going to weave in into our manager programs how you can support people who are who are doing this doing this work and maybe particular programs for managers but we also want to get the results of the quantitative research as well the validation piece about it before we really put anything out 
out to 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 market because as I mentioned at the start, we're evidence and data driven. Anything we put out is going to have a really solid solid evidence base. So there was one comment that wasn't actually a question, but I'd like to I'd like to address, and then we'll have one more. We'll end on a positive on a positive one. But um, but somebody made the comment when you were talking about HR that said, I feel like HR are there to protect the company rather than employees. And I know, Caroline, obviously, that you spend a lot of time talking to human resources people and learning and development people. So I'd really like your your take on that. What what would you say to somebody who who has that has that concern? Um, I think it's a valid concern. Um, I've been on both sides of the fence. I've been in HR teams and I've been in the business. Um, and it can feel like that a lot of the time when you're in the business, but it's also very hard when you're in HR because you are in this tension point. So you're constantly getting pressure from the business, from leaders and managers to do things one way and you know to look after them. And then you're getting obviously pressure from employees to look after them. And you want to do that. Well, certainly the HR teams I've worked for and in, um, that's been this constant, this constant tension. So I do, I do fully understand it. And I think it's really different in different organisations and actually even down to individuals. So within one team I've worked for, there have been individuals who really care about the employees and there have been other individuals who do care but maybe are protecting the organisation slightly more than, than the employee. I think that's a totally valid, a totally valid comment. Um, I'd like to give you a, a, you know, an answer that was less ambiguous than that, but I, I think it's valid. Yeah, and I think that's a really good, good, good point about there are different individuals within HR teams as well, and and there is a conflicting set of responsibilities there that I think is a fundamental challenge with the Department of Human Resources. But um, but it is worth maybe trying to get to know some more people in human resources because we'll talk to organizations that have lots of issues around it, but then also have people within HR teams who are doing their best to be allies and advocates and, and help. So the, the question I wanna end with was, um, did you find any examples of organizations that are successfully recognizing people who are driving DNI on a voluntary basis, or is it pretty much consistently poor? I said end on positive, I'm not sure. Caroline, maybe it's not so. <laughs> um, yes, um, uh, one organization, um, who I spoke to and I've spoken to since were in the process of adjusting the KPIs and the goals of the people um, doing this work to reflect this work. So that was actually in the process of happening and was being, being taken really seriously. Um, a couple of people talked about having uh, leadership recognition. Um, one individual um, is doing really, is, has been promoted and promoted. Um, and, and has been doing this work and, and doing really impactful work as well, actually, not just around engagement, um, but has a platform. Who really, they really do have a platform. Um, in part, they've made that platform, but in part, obviously, the platform comes with the job they have. Um, but they've been, they've definitely been recognised um, and have done that really well. And I think that that's consistent with the broader organisation they're in. So there are examples of it. There were also other examples of where it was done in a really mixed way. So some individuals were getting recognised and some individuals weren't. And that also comes to the question I have around demographics, around whether or not it is playing out differently for different different people. So a little bit of positive, a little bit of not so positive. A little bit of a mix there. Well, good. Well, I think that's all for all for us for today. So thank you everybody so much for, for coming and for participating in the polls and the chat. As I said, you'll get a follow-up from us with the report, as well as a survey on what you thought of the of the session. Um, contact details below as, as well. So if you have any questions, if you wanna get in touch with us directly, I'm Melissa at The Honeycomb Works. Caroline is Caroline at The Honeycomb Works. So easy to, easy to remember. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we'd love to continue the conversation and you'll hear from us again soon. Thank you. Thank you all.